Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hassan Hakimian. I'm the director of the London Middle East Institute here at SOAS, your host uh, over the next day and a half, uh, and also co-convener with Dr. Alanud al Sharif of this timely conference. We don't often gather together uh, on a Friday morning late in May to talk about population and demography, but uh, there's no denying that uh, this is a very good time. Um, I'm going to uh, give you a very short welcome and introduction and then move on because we have a very interesting and packed program and I'm sure everybody's here to hear the speakers first and foremost. Uh, I want to indulge for a few minutes just to say a few things about uh, SOAS and the Institute. Uh, for those of you especially who may be new and who may not uh, know too much about who we are and what we do. Uh, that'll be very brief. And then a little bit about the theme of the conference and why uh, this particular topic at this particular point in time. Uh, for those of you who are new to SOAS, uh, you may think that you know, life here is rather uh, slow. I just want to remind that this is actually at the peak of, we are at the peak of the examination time. Our students are in exam halls, and our fellow academics are busy marking papers. So we've taken a, a bit of a time out in organizing this conference at this particular point in time uh, on this particular topic. As you might know, SOAS is one of the leading institutions for the study of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And the London Middle East Institute here represents uh, the community of scholars and specialist academics, about 80, 85 of them here in SOAS, who uh, specialize on this region, broadly defined, uh, including North Africa, uh, the Arab countries, Iran, Turkey, of course. And, um, and, and this is uh, something that we have been doing for quite a long time. We cover, as is, as is very much the character of SOAS, we cover a very broad range of subjects and disciplines, mainly in the area of social sciences, humanities, languages, and culture. Uh, you might be interested to know that uh, here at SOAS, we take pride and excel in, in the teaching of some 65 plus languages of Asian Africa. So on a normal day, if you wander around, uh, don't be surprised if within a five minute time span you hear Arabic, Chinese, Korean, Persian, Gujarati, Zulu, you know, Swahili, and the list goes on. It's, it's quite amazing. Some of these are, of course, very sm small and specialized classes. Uh, the, I'm told the three most popular languages are uh, Chinese, Japanese, and uh, Arabic. This counts for something like well, more than half of the student numbers doing languages here. At the institute, uh, where I have had the pleasure and the responsibility of uh, directing over the last four years, uh, we've been very busy, as you can imagine. Anybody who knows anything about the Middle East uh, over the last three, four years, this, is, this has been very, very interesting times, very challenging times, and a time when not only specialist interest in the region has been heightened, but also the public. The public really are thirsty for knowledge and understanding of the region. And this is another aspect of what we do, not just focusing on academic scholarly work like conferences, publications, and so on, but also outreach. I can assure you many, many times in the year, this wonderful hall is full. Not quite like this morning yet, but quite full in sessions that we organize around themes relating to various aspects and dimensions of the Middle East. Uh, in fact, three years ago, uh, we took advantage of the rather excellent concentration of academic expertise in Iranian studies at SOAS to set up a specialist sub-center within the institute uh, called Center for Iranian Studies. That was 2010. And that was followed up by another uh, specialist center, rather unique, Center for Palestine Studies, which was done in 2012. Um, in your conference pack, there is a wonderful magazine 
uh, at least I think it's a wonderful magazine. It's called uh, Middle East in London. This is a flagship publication of our institute. It's published uh, bi-monthly. Uh, the last issue in your folder is in fact the next issue, which is for the next month, which is for June, July. And as it happens, uh, it's on the subject of oil, past, present, future. And oil, along with population and demography, is of course the other side of a very, very pertinent coin when it comes to the Middle East and the GCC. I want to thank, uh, I want to briefly say thank you to a number of uh, people uh, before I say something about the topic of the conference and then hand over to my colleague who will introduce our eminent uh, keynote speaker. Conferences of this nature are impossible without uh, <clears throat> foresight, without commitment, without organization and planning, and of course without uh, support. I'm grateful to Dr. Khaled Al Khalifa from uh, Bahrain uh, College from University College of Bahrain for his generous sponsorship of this conference. Uh, you will have an opportunity to hear him later this afternoon. He, he would be on one of the panels. So a big thank you for uh, Dr. Khalid. Uh, my colleague, Alan Oud, uh, who's a co-convener, who will uh, chair the next session. Uh, the idea of a conference on the demography of GCC uh, originally was hers. And without her commitment, without her uh, dedication and relentless effort, uh, we wouldn't be here today, so thank you, Alan Oud. Um, it's virtually impossible to list everybody who supported us, so I beg forgiveness if I have missed out uh, one or two of you. But of course, uh, thanks also go to the speakers and uh, presenters who have taken time off to be here with us, to our uh, keynote speaker, Professor Coleman, um, everybody's busy, uh, committing yourselves to be here, as we know very well, uh, has very high opportunity cost, and especially for those of you who have had to travel. Our consolation is that I hope you very much will enjoy <clears throat> the deliberations. You'll find this a very productive conference. You'll have an opportunity to network with others. Uh, and for those of you who come from the region, well, the consolation of taking some time off from temperatures in the mid-40s, welcome to London. We don't plan the weather, but I think, you know, this is, this is quite nice. Uh, so I hope you agree. Now, let me say a few words about population and demography and then move on. Uh, fascination, if not concerned with population and demographic issues, uh, runs very deep in social sciences amongst economists, sociologists, demographers, anthropologists, and the list goes on. Uh, I suppose ever since the Malthusian law of, uh, iron law of population, there has been concern about the ability of Mother Earth to support an ever-growing uh, tendency for humankind to uh, multiplicate its numbers through procreation and so on. Although we were lucky to escape the worst uh, doomsday scenario put forward by Malthus, nevertheless, concerns about population growth have been a running theme through various decades and have surfaced in different ways and formats. Concern about population explosion, concern about uh, huge resources devoted to population control. It's very uh, rarely a country which doesn't have some policy of some sort on population, whether it's to do with population growth acceleration or deceleration. Um, and as with most social science th themes, uh, there is far from unanimity on the importance of uh, population uh, growth. What may, be seem, what may seem to be a problem for some is uh, at the same time an opportunity to others. Population seen from one perspective may be another mouth to feed, another stomach to fill, especially in the context of poorer countries. But population, as we have also been reminded by uh, Nobel laureate uh, uh, Professor Simon Kuznets, 
also means more brains, more skills, more hands, more artists, more inventors. So whichever perspective you look at, population and demog demography is very much at the heart of social change. I suppose I am converting to, I am preaching to a converted audience, uh, and I don't need to elaborate too much on this. Uh, this is the theme of the conference. Uh, but we also know that it wasn't just growth rate or the tempo of population that has exercised academic, scholarly uh, concern and policy debates. The composition of population, the makeup, whether in terms of age, the youth dimension, uh, uh, you know, the, the gender composition, or the foreign uh, migrant, local, indigenous composition has also come under scrutiny. Those of us who uh, took part in European elections only last week, we were reminded again of the potency of this very aspect, the composition of population and the mix between uh, local, indigenous and and migrant communities. So it's not just the GCC, it's not just the Middle East, where this subject is going to be with us for quite some time, but also here in Europe, we experience it, we live with the consequences. So allow me to say that this is a very timely uh, conference uh, here at our institute. Uh, it is a first, we've never hosted a conference focused on demography and population change. The focus is on social and economic aspects. I mean, this subject is huge. We could well have had a conference on the political dimensions, but that's not really what we are here. Uh, the social and economic implications are both important and important enough to keep us very, very busy and engaged. And I hope this will be an excellent opportunity not only to hear from experts, uh, but also have an opportunity to participate in the discussions, put your questions to the panel, and uh, overall, as I said, uh, enjoy this conference. If uh, you're back to SOAS, as many of you are familiar faces, welcome back, and if it's your first time to SOAS, a very special welcome. Uh, just uh, to finish, uh, one or two housekeeping announcements. I know in this day and age, very few of us uh, s survive without being online. If you are wondering about Wi-Fi, I'm told that uh, there is a BT zone wireless. You'll have to go online to BT open zone and then uh, you'll be guided from there how to spend your money and how to be live online, if that is what you're impatient to do. Uh, and otherwise, uh, our chairs, have been asked to try and keep to time as far as possible. It's inevitable that uh, on a gray Friday morning like this in London, we start a few minutes late. We expect bigger numbers and people will come throughout. So again, thank you very much for your interest and for your presence and a big welcome. I hand over to Alan. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great privilege to be here, to be invited to speak at SOAS for, for the first time in my life, uh, and particularly in this extremely elegant uh, lecture theatre. Um, I have to confess uh, that while I was delighted to be asked to address this meeting by, by Alan Nur al Sharek uh, some time ago, nonetheless I was slightly alarmed because um, I must confess to you that my expertise, insofar as I have any, um, is, uh, relates to the populations of the developed world um, and, and not of the Arab world or, or of the Gulf. Um, nonetheless, um, um, it appears that some of the phenomena which are taking place in, in the Western world uh, may possibly be of interest uh, uh, to, to members of this audience, even though they have not yet arrived in the Arab states and may never do so. Um, I speak of this, this so-called second demographic transition, of which more anon. Um, 
Uh, I'm not at all suggesting that developments of this kind which happen in the West automatically happen everywhere else. That would be very arrogant, but it might do. Uh, if it does, um, it will r be a very radical uh, alteration and change, uh, uh, an upset uh, in social arrangements and also in the economy. It will benefit um, one half of the population. The other half of the population will see their privileges and their power and their traditional authority very considerably eroded. Um, let me uh, perhaps uh, proceed um, f by spending some time talking about what happens in the West. I hope you will not find this boringly irrelevant, but I've got to explain what happens there and, and why this uh, second demographic transition, so-called, is deemed to be so important before I can go on uh, to, 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 to uh, rather briefly um, see how far um, it may or may not have manifested itself outside Europe in various other parts of the world. I'll talk about the Far East, I'll talk about uh, the Gulf States. To begin at the beginning, um, the first demographic transition has to be explained before the second one. Now, many of you in this audience will know very well what the first demographic transition is all about. Uh, perhaps some of you do not, so perhaps I should very briefly say what's going on. Essentially, the first demographic transition um, is, is the technical name for a tremendous improvement in, in human welfare, uh, which has, which has uh, proceeded over the last 200 years, uh, involving essentially um, the partial conquest of death uh, and the, the assumption of control over the birth rate, um, such that the old-fashioned regime um, whereby populations um, experienced perhaps six, seven, eight uh, children ever born, of whom most would die um, with an expectation of life at birth of 35 years at best, has been, this has been transformed in almost all the countries of the world into a position where um, women have not more than two children on average in, 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 in many countries, uh, and where expectation of life at birth among the women uh, in, of Europe at the moment, for example, um, is over 80, and where the pundits believe that a, a newborn baby born now has a 50-50 chance of living to be aged at 100. Now, because the death rate in, almost invariably falls before the birth rate, I'll not go into the reasons why, I'm sure you can imagine why, um, that there is an intervening period of quite rapid population growth, whereby the population previously hardly growing at all uh, may increase uh, four, five, six, seven, eight times uh, in the course of the century. Then, in due course, uh, the, death rate, the birth rate and death rate come into balance again at much more lower, much more acceptable uh, uh, levels, uh, and population growth uh, fizzles out and may even even lead to population decline. These events began in the developed world uh, in, in England and elsewhere uh, about 1750 or so, very roughly speaking, um, uh, and in various other parts of the world for uh, various times in the 20th century. A, a handful of countries still have not begun this. Uh, in Northwest Africa, there are still countries like Niger, where the ladies of Niger say that they want to have about seven babies, and where they do have seven babies. Uh, this generates rapid population growth of a kind, the consequences of which I really cannot imagine. Um, this is believed to be something which will eventually cover the entire world, the, the, the advantages of, of a smaller family size, of living longer, of, of, of deferring death to, to old age, uh, are so huge uh, that they, they will be irresistible. We shall see. This is the shape of this transition. Uh, on the left, at the top, you see um, this so-called total fertility rate. It's merely an indicator of how many babies a woman is likely to have, going from five, six, or seven uh, in the top left-hand corner of the graph down to about two. Um, then we have an improvement in life expectancy from 20 or 30 up to uh, 70 or 80. Uh, and because the two things are out of kilter, uh, we have a growth rate uh, uh, which goes up to about 3% per year at its peak. That is doubling every 22 or 23 years, which means the population will double four times in a century at that rate. Uh, and of course, the population size therefore hugely increases before eventually, we believe, stabilizing or possibly falling. This is what the, the Gulf states are, are, are doing in this context. This is the Gulf states population of Kuwait, UAE, um, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, and Oman uh, from 1950 to, to 2065, um, set um, that so that all of them have a population of 100 uh, in the year 2015. That's where they're all so close together. Of course, they're all, in reality, uh, very different. And you can see that, this, uh, that they all follow roughly this logistic curve, uh, made complicated, of course, by the huge influx of migration. 
um, which, which is um, a, a unique characteristic of, of, of the Gulf states. Um, but you can see that the, the projection by the United Nations expects that while the population of Kuwait is still um, uh, merrily increasing rapidly, uh, even by 2065, uh, that of the uh, United Arab, Arab Emirates and uh, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and Qatar and Oman will have stabilized or even be in decline. These are only projections. Uh, all projections are always wrong. Uh, all that matters is uh, how wrong they are, um, and uh, these are the best that can be, that can be done looking forward in, into the future. Um, who knows what, what may change to, to upset them. What about this second demographic transition? We've had this first one, which is almost entirely uh, beneficial, indeed necessary for the survival of the human species. The second one is a phenomenon which started becoming apparent in Europe in, in the and also in the United States uh, in the 1960s. In the, in the mid-1950s, when I was a little boy, um, there was a kind of golden age of demography in, in terms of family life. Um, uh, divorce um, ended fewer than one marriage in 10. Um, fewer than four babies out of a thousand were born outside marriage. Cohabitation uh, was, was, was uh, very rare. Um, uh, the the, 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 the uh, characteristic of the underclass or of bohemians and hardly anybody else. Uh, everything seemed to be very stable. From the 1960s onwards, all that began to change. Um, uh, marriage became very much later, having been, uh, made, been made earlier in the baby wound period and became marginalized. Uh, divorce increased rapidly uh, and now in many countries uh, terminates uh, one marriage in two uh, by, the, by 25 years of marriage duration. Um, cohabitation, uh, formerly, formerly frowned on, uh, uh, has become normal. Um, the majority of, of people marry before, uh, uh, before they get married. Uh, almost everyone cohabits before they marry for the second time, if they marry for the second time. Uh, and increasing numbers of people don't marry at all, but remain cohabiting, or, or what used to be called in now forbidden <laughs> antique parlance, uh, living in sin. Um, this means that in, many, in some countries, up to 60% of children are born outside marriage, uh, not, not inside marriage. This, this means, of course, there's a huge diversity uh, in the way that people live their lives. Some people um, uh, uh, marry in the conventional way um, and have all their children within marriage and don't divorce. Uh, others uh, never marry, have a succession of partners, uh, may have children by, by, by those uh, different partners um, uh, who have a very different experience, of course, than the children brought up in conventional fashion. And the childbearing is postponed. Postponement of more or less everything of childbearing, uh, of marriage, um, of, of, of death, of course, is, is the great characteristic of demography in the 20th and uh, 21st century. The fundamental underpinning of this, according to its prophets, uh, Dirk van der Kaar and, and Ron Leistager, um, is uh, the growth of prosperity and literacy and secularism in the societies which, have, um, um, which, which support these trends. Um, that uh, as they became rich, as they became educated, uh, as uh, religion began to be questioned and to lose its grip, uh, um, as educated populations started to question the kind of authority they were previously expected to to um, feel for, for, for country, for parents, uh, for, the, for the views of relatives, people started doing their own thing. Uh, and because the countries were rich, because there was a welfare blanket, uh, the welfare costs of having child, children out of marriage, uh, the welfare costs of, of being divorced were picked up uh, by, by the state, um, uh, uh, partly by families, but mostly by the state. Uh, and without that, it would not have been possible uh, for it to develop. Um, Leysager and van der Kaar uh, feel that as populations become richer, um, as welfare becomes more widespread, as um, uh, populations become uh, more, more secular and, and, and uh, feel that religion is less important or not important at all, uh, which is characteristic of most, most societies in Western Europe, um, um, and as they become more educated, uh, these patterns will become universal. That is their projection. So far, they certainly have not become universal, and they may not do so. And part of the point of this talk is, is, to, is to have a very brief look as to whether this might be the case in, in the Gulf states, um, which is perhaps the, the least ob obvious area where they might prosper. This is the kind of model which, which um, uh, Leistager and van der Kaar have in mind. Um, they're they're um, uh, 
um, the initial guru is Abraham Maslow, um, whose book Motivation and Personality inspired um, their, um, their, their concepts in this matter. Uh, the, the notion that as human society develops, um, various basic fundamental needs for protection, for survival, um, um, are, are foremost in simple society, uh, that as these gradually get, get um, uh, met uh, by the development of society and its economy, um, eventually at the top, um, uh, material needs are more or less guaranteed, um, safety is more or less guaranteed, and people start uh, doing their own thing. Uh, they, they become more individualistic, they, begin, they become looking after uh, their own interests uh, because they haven't got to worry about uh, other things of a more pressing kind, which, which were uh, imperative earlier on in development. To go back to the beginning, this is the old marriage regime in, in, in Western Europe. In, in those days, for many centuries, back to the 17th century and almost certainly to medieval times, um, uh, mean age of marriage for men was, was about 27, 28. Mean age of marriage for women was about first marriage. This is, was 25, 26 or so. Um, quite high proportions never married at all rather unusually, in fact, probably uniquely in the world uh, at that time and, and since. Up to 24% or 27%, in fact, of women never married at all in, in, in their lives uh, in, in Britain, in Sweden, um, in parts of Germany, in Denmark, uh, and elsewhere. And this remained true right up to the middle of the 20th century. Um, uh, and this is the contrast between the northwestern Europe on, on the one hand, represented here by Belgium and Sweden, um, and the rest of the world, eastern Europe, Bulgaria and Serbia, uh, Turkey, Japan, India, um, showing that uh, uh, women, uh, men and women uh, in their 40s, uh, and after one's uh, 40 or 50, one's perhaps rather less likely to marry than otherwise would be the case, um, um, substantial numbers of men and of women are never married at all. Uh, in the rest of the world, one or two or three percent never married at all, and this is the case, of course, in, in the Gulf states. Is that where we're going? Um, this is a graph showing the, the, the um, two curious things, the persistence of late age of marriage right up to um, uh, the 1950s in England and Wales, um, the, the old pattern, a dip uh, in the baby womb period in, in the 1950s and 60s where uh, my cohort, I was born in 1946, was the most heavily married cohort in British history for several hundred years. Almost everyone got married, and this is highly unusual. You can see the age of marriage went down um, since the 60s and 70s. It's been going upwards, we in age of marriage now, uh, approaching 30 uh, for, me, for men and, and, and uh, almost that for women too. And this is absolutely characteristic of Europe. This is a mean age of first marriage for women um, in groups of European countries, Scandinavia, Southern Europe, Northwest Europe, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, uh, and Yugoslavia, um, all starting off at different points, but all heading in the same direction, as, as you can see. Uh, and what, what goes uh, hand in hand with, with this later and later and later marriage um, is the fact that fewer and fewer women uh, ever get married at all. Um, here's some data from, uh, from the various countries around the year 2000, um, showing in the, the light blue uh, bar the proportion of women who ever married, uh, uh, who, uh, born in 1935, uh, and the dark blue bar, those who ever married, born um, in, uh, in, in, in 1960. Uh, and, and they, of course, are now 50 years old and all their marriage is done, so these are final figures. And as you can see in Sweden, about 90% of women born in the 1930s uh, were, were, were married at least once in their lives. Um, uh, of those married in 1960, only about 65% um, uh, have been ever married, and the proportion has gone down uh, quite a lot ever since then. You can see there's some variation uh, in that pattern in different uh, European societies, but the trend is always in the same direction, always downwards. Instead, people cohabit. Uh, these are data on the proportion of women um, uh, and men um, aged uh, in their mid-20s to mid-30s uh, at the same time, around 2000, um, who, who have ever cohabited uh, compared with those who, who, are, um, who are ever married. Um, the, the, the pale blue is those who, who, who have married um, at that time. Uh, the dark blue is those who, who are unmarried and who are co have who have cohabited. As you can see in Sweden and in Denmark, uh, the majority of people uh, in that age group are cohabiting um, or were cohabiting uh, rather than married. Um, and this varies quite a lot in different parts of, 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 of Europe. Um, quite a lot of variation, as I mentioned. This second demographic transition is not yet a universal pattern by any means. It, it's created diversity. Diversity in each, in, within Europe, as you see from these, these different uh, national patterns. Diversity within regions. Diversity even within each street, you will see, you will find some people living a more conventional life in terms of sexual behavior, in terms of uh, married life, 
and all the rest, uh, and others who, are, who, who are follow a much more uh, modern pattern, if I can call it that. And th these are the, the trends of people not marrying in various European countries. This is a, a crude indicator of the likelihood of, of getting married. Uh, it goes from 1960 to 2010. Uh, and as, as you see, 95% um, uh, of people are married uh, in, in, the, in, in the 50s and 60s, and then this is dropped down to perhaps about uh, 50 or 60% uh, in, in, in most countries um, by the present day. This, this is a, there's a lot of variation, but the, the trend is unmistakable. It is also interesting, though, that this, this is not going to zero. The, the, the direction so far is certainly not that marriage is, is being abolished or that no one gets married. Um, it seems to be stabilizing at a position where maybe 50, 60, 70 percent marry um, and, uh, and, and the rest will cohabit for the rest of their lives. And of course, cohabitation is much more fragile than marriage. Uh, it's between two and four times more likely to break up than a marital relationship with all the co consequences for, for the children uh, concerned. So that, that's what Europe's doing. Um, and divorce also, um, as I mentioned, formerly very, uh, very light, only one in 10 uh, uh, marriages ending in divorce by 25 years. Um, here we have uh, in, a, in a, a selection of, of, of countries, some Eastern European, some Western European, um, an, an increase in, in the proportion who are likely to get married, going up to 50% uh, by 2011. And that's pretty typical. The crucial point, uh, the, the one which is really perhaps most marked of all uh, and represents the biggest departure from previous experience in terms of um, a transgression of previous moral norms uh, is the proportion of births outside marriage. Uh, formerly very low, um, as I mentioned, about 4% uh, of births outside marriage um, in, in, uh, in Northwestern Europe in the 1950s. Uh, now, as, as you see in the Nordic countries, uh, approaching 50%, Nordic countries in, uh, are the red line. The English-speaking world outside Europe um, nudging uh, 40%, um, uh, Western Europe also nudging 40%. Some signs of stabilization in the Nordic countries, as you see so far, uh, no sign of stabilization in the others. It keeps on going up and up and up. And I think in, uh, in, in Britain, the proportion um, uh, just exceeded 52% and is higher in, in Wales and Scotland uh, than in England. Can we connect this with, with people's behavior and attitudes? We can. Generally speaking, uh, those people who um, uh, follow the, the new modes and cast aside the restraints of the past uh, and do their own thing tend to have what uh, most people would call progressive attitudes of tolerance uh, towards uh, other people's behavior, tolerance towards other kinds of religion, a tolerance to, to those who, who have no religion, tolerance towards homosexuality, tolerance towards foreigners and ethnic difference. Uh, and there are ways of measuring uh, this, these differences in attitudes, which uh, Leysaga um, uh, and Engelhardt call post-materialism. Uh, I think it's a very unhelpful term, but nonetheless, uh, that's, uh, that's what they call it. And you can see here the, the kind of questionnaire, rather simple questionnaire, which they, uh, which they uh, hand out in surveys, um, uh, which attempts to measure whether people are on the progressive wing or the non-progressive wing, whether they are post-materialist in their jargon or materialist. Uh, and those, those who, aren't, who, who, who say yes to the, to, to the blue questions tend to be those of a traditional point of view. Uh, those who, who, who say yes to the green questions tend to be of a more progressive uh, point of view. And as, as you can see, uh, the, the, uh, the traditionalist uh, uh, questions relate to order, discipline, um, regularity, uh, and, and things of that kind, economic growth, uh, defense, uh, fighting against crime, uh, whereas, whereas those, those uh, um, who answer the other questions are much more in, interested in, in, in personal um, attributes in a friendly society, in the environment. You can imagine, perhaps, that the people um, who answer the blue questions with a, with a yes are those who read, let's say, the Daily Telegraph, and those who answer the green ones uh, are those who, who read the, the Guardian or the Independent. It might just be a much simpler way of getting an answer to the question, by the way. 
this manifests itself in, in all kinds of interesting things. The, the, ignore these, these data, they're just here for my, my benefit. What, what this table shows is on, on a very large scale survey across Europe, um, uh, people, people's behavior in respect of marriage and sex and living arrangements uh, follows uh, the, 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 their views about how the world works and what is right uh, and what is wrong. So, for example, what these data show uh, uh, is that those who are cohabiting um, uh, rather than those who are married of the same age are only one third is likely to believe in God. Uh, those who are cohabiting, uh, as opposed to those who are married at the same age, are only one third as likely to believe in sin. Only one third, only half as likely to pray outside church. Um, uh, they're, they're also much happier about the, about the idea of taking drugs, of cheating the tax man, avoiding fares, and <laughs> curiously fighting with police. This seems to be a habit which is more common, perhaps, on the continent than in England. Um, uh, Curiously enough, when it comes to environmental things, there's no difference. Um, there, there's no difference in the hostility towards uh, littering the place, making the place untidy, uh, throwing your cigarette packet away and so on. No difference in opposition to lying. Uh, no, opposite, no difference in opposition to drink driving. So it, it, it's not a complete collapse of morality. It's a focus of, uh, of morality on what, on what the, the, the progressive people think is important compared with, with those things which they think is not important. And th this is uh, just a, a, a graph to show, um, uh, in, in brief, um, the relationship across countries, all the way from Romania in the bottom left-hand corner to Sweden in the top, between uh, indicators of progressiveness of opinion on the one hand uh, and progressiveness of behavior uh, on the other, um, th th by which I mean um, uh, high levels of divorce, high levels of cohabitation, high levels of birth outside marriage. They go hand in hand on an international as well as a personal basis um, with um, uh, the adoption of progressive or non-progressive attitudes. There are some problems with this concept. Um, uh, it, it is, first of all, very far from being a universal transition, and it's not at all clear um, that it is um, uh, not going to be universal as well. You will, I will doubtless learn uh, a great deal in the course of this conference, uh, and one of them may be a much cl cl clearer insight as the likelihood of any of these patterns becoming common uh, in, in, in the Gulf states, uh, where I, I imagine that they would, they, would, they would be regarded with considerable uh, uh, disgust and disquiet. Um, also, there are, there are some patterns, which are, as we will see, which are happening which resemble these patterns, which uh, must be explained by, by a different model, which can't be explained by um, uh, the development of a, of a prosperous, liberal, uh, peaceful, welfare-oriented society of, of liberal-minded people. Um, and there are certainly no indications of it happening yet in, in the Arab Muslim societies, neither in, in, in Muslim societies in their countries of origin, nor among Muslims in Britain. One of the huge um, exceptions to this second demographic uh, uh, transition trend uh, in, in, in Britain and other uh, Muslim populations of immigrant origin uh, in the West um, is their rejection of much of this behavior. Births outside marriage in Muslim populations in Britain are about 1%. Uh, compared with about 50% in, in the non-Muslim population. And, I, and that is the case also, I believe, else, elsewhere in Europe. So the Muslim population so far has said no uh, to this, uh, certainly in Europe and, and I think everywhere else as well. It isn't, as I mentioned, yet a, 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 a transition and may not do so, so I, I will skip over that. Another question about this, uh, th this trend is whether it's sustainable. I mentioned that it, it rather depends uh, for, its, for its flourishing on the provision of, 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 a, of a welfare cushion in a rich society. It challenges that welfare cushion by taking quite a lot of it, because in the nature of things, uh, if, if a woman has a, a child outside marriage, uh, or, or two or three children outside marriage, it becomes ipso facto much more difficult for her uh, to be in employment, although not impossible, uh, uh, and, and therefore she tends to be much more dependent upon welfare. And there are indeed perverse incentives in the welfare system in Britain and possibly elsewhere which induce women to follow that route because the welfare is there, because the housing provision uh, is there in a way which, is, which was not the case in the past and is not the case in other countries. Likewise, when, when people divorce, um, this creates three households on average where two existed before. 
It costs money. Um, the divorced couple have to be supported, or at least the, 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 the former wife usually has to be supported. Um, and um, uh, there, are, there are also all kinds of problems to do with the behavior of children. It, it seems this is a controversial matter, but there is some evidence anyway that children brought up in, in these less conventional circumstances have more trouble uh, of a psychological nature, more difficulties at school, more difficulties integrating into society, to, uh, can be less happy, as you might imagine, when deprived of, 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 of their parents. And this must be true uh, universally. And the costs are considerable. Uh, and, uh, the, 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 the costs may um, create something of a break on the progress of this second demographic transition, partly because of uh, people perceiving the costs themselves, and also because um, governments may try to calm down uh, these trends, or, or at least moderate or, or manage them in some way, which, which, which uh, moderates their cost. Um, the present government, for example, in, in this country, uh, is, is uh, adopting policies which are trying to, to mitigate uh, the effect of the second demographic transition. They're not put in those terms. I'm sure our ministers haven't heard of the second demographic transition. Nonetheless, they are grappling with the cost consequences of it uh, in, in a big way. One um, challenge to, to this model um, is in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, there are very substantial, uh, after the fall of communism, there were very substantial changes taking place in the society. Uh, the, the, um, the, the birth rate, formerly quite high by Western terms, about uh, two or so per woman, uh, collapsed uh, over the course of a couple of years. Um, the proportion of births outside marriage greatly increased. The, um, uh, the average age of marriage started to, 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 um, to, to be postponed very markedly. Cohabitation became very common. Uh, all kinds of, uh, of signs of this kind, which indicate that the second demographic transition had at last arrived um, uh, with, with the collapse of, of the Iron Curtain uh, and, and the Berlin Wall uh, and all that. This is really quite a, a difficult idea to swallow because, of course, what was going on uh, in, 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 the, in that part of the world um, was not uh, a, a, an instant increase in, in GDP per head, an increase in, in welfare, an increase in, 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 in uh, um, social improvement, but on the contrary, it was a time of, 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 of crisis, of a new unemployment, new inflation, things which previously had not existed in the communist society, uh, and very considerable reduction uh, in material standards of living for some time, much less now, depending on which country you're, you're, you're in. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, it, it, the, um, uh, it, it looked superficially as a second demographic transition behavior in divorce, in marriage, in birth outside marriage was, was, was arrived. Uh, the circumstances were entirely opposite to those which are meant to promote uh, such trends in, in, in more stable societies. Uh, much more likely that these, that these, these trends were due to a, a partial breakdown of society to what my Eastern European colleagues call anomie. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, that was manifested in the fact that quite a, the, the, the most extreme development of these patterns, uh, the, the, the abandonment of marriage, um, births outside marriage, divorce, were, were concentrated in the poorer section of the population and also in the rural population, which you wouldn't expect uh, in, in a second demographic transition model. This is curiously the case in, in, in Europe as well. Uh, although... Um, Intellectuals were the pioneers uh, in these behaviors. In intellectuals being much more likely to challenge religion, challenge received authority, and all the rest. Uh, and um, 30 years ago, um, the, the cohabitation and divorce were something which was more associated with, 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 with the more literate and, uh, and professional classes. Now it's quite the reverse. Um, the, the powerful concentration of divorce, of marital breakdown, of cohabitation, of births outside marriage is in poorer people uh, in less skilled uh, occupation. This, this just shows the, the scale of the difference. Um, this, these are births outside marriage in percent in, in, in Wales recently, according to the socioeconomic category of the father, um, with, with uh, um, uh, what used to be called social class one and two on the left, uh, about 20% of births outside marriage, uh, and what used to be called social class five on the right, routine manual workers, uh, with over 60% of births outside marriage. And this is fairly typical of other countries as well. So the great question is, is this transition 
starting in rich areas outside Europe, the Anglosphere also, by which I mean England, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the United States, and, 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 and Canada, and, and the Americas. Both uh, parts of the Americas clearly show uh, this development. Uh, the US is a pioneer in this development. Uh, Europe, especially Western Europe, is, is right in the forefront. What's happening elsewhere? Can we see signs of this uh, in, in the East, East Asia? Can we see it in the Middle East? Can we see it in the Gulf states? Uh, and the sort of question we want to ask uh, um, is marriage being delayed? Um, is the choice of marriage partner free? Is divorce increasing? Um, is cohabitation happening and becoming more acceptable morally? Are births outside marriage correspondingly uh, increasing? Um, is society becoming more secularized? How are women treated? One of the crucial elements of this second demographic transition is uh, what's called in, in more jargon gender equity. Um, the equal, equal, equal opportunity and equal performance of women in education, in promotion, um, uh, in politics, uh, and everything else. And are um, the tolerant attitudes gaining ground uh, towards homosexuality, abortion, and all these other things um, um, prominent uh, in, in, in societies uh, which are uh, following these demographic patterns? Well, if you look at East Asia, if you'll allow me to, to jump across the, the, the globe a bit, if you look at East Asia, we find certainly um, that some of these uh, indicators get a tick. Um, marked delay in, in, in marriage uh, in e East Asia. I'm talking about the rich industrial countries of East Asia, here Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and Japan, uh, from what were quite early, quite young ages in the 1950s. This graph goes from 1945 to 2011. Um, you can see it was uh, um, in Japan, mean age of marriage for women was 23 uh, in, in 1948, and in, in Korea, even younger, about 20. And uh, now it's, it's, uh, it was 29, and it's still heading up. Uh, in, in an apparently inexorable fashion. So uh, that one uh, gets a tick, delayed, delayed marriage. Um, also, proportions of women never married also appear to be going up. It's too early to tell um, how many will never get married because they've reached age 50 or so, and therefore uh, their chances of getting married are, are, um, are, are low. But these, th these data here show, for example, that in Japan in 1960, um, women in their 30s, only 9% had never married. Uh, in 2010, 32% uh, uh, of women in Japan had never married in their 30s. And there must be a very good chance uh, that some of those women will never marry in the course of their lifetime. There are lots of reasons why marriage is unattractive for women in Japan, uh, which I won't insult the Japanese by uh, repeating here. But you can see the figures are high, uh, also in Taiwan, uh, in Singapore, uh, in Hong Kong, and they're getting higher in Korea as well. Divorces um, also going up. Um, never negligible in, in, in Japan and Korea, particularly in Japan. But now um, um, the ratio of, of, of divorces to, to, to marriages uh, in, in, in recent years is about um, uh, um, 35 to 100. For, for every 100 marriages in, in, in recent years, there have been 35 divorces. This, you'll appreciate, is a rotten indicator because, of course, the, the, the divorces which happen in a particular year are, are usually, in most cases, not the marriages that happened in that particular year. Uh, the ideal would be to look at, at, at marriages after 5, 10, 15, 20 years and see what proportion had ended in, in divorce. I can't do that. Uh, this is a, a coarse indicator which gives you some idea of, of the burden of divorce compared with the, uh, with the entry into marriage. And it's getting very high in those countries. However, the crucial test of this second demographic transition <coughs> is whether this translates itself um, into a tolerance of uh, children being brought up outside marriage, of women uh, cohabiting uh, and, and bringing up children uh, without a husband in, 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 the, in the background. And as you can see, it's trivial. Uh, in, in Japan, which is the, the long orange uh, line at the bottom, um, uh, the, the, the figure is, uh, is even now uh, about 20 per thousand, uh, about 2% of births outside marriages. Absolutely unacceptable. Um, the, uh, uh, my Japanese colleagues are absolutely horrified by what we, what we do in Europe and, and regard it as being completely out of the question that anything of that kind uh, could happen in Japan. They may well be right. However, uh, there are indications in Japan and also in, in, in the other uh, countries in that area that things are changing with respect to cohabitation. Um, I used to think that cohabitation in Korea, for example, 
and Japan uh, was, was, was rather limited and rare. Uh, when, I said, when I said this to my, my, my students, uh, my um, uh, Korean and Japanese students, who I have a fair number, jumped up and said, no, no, Dr. Coleman, this, this is wrong, it's, it's happening all over the place, people just don't talk about it. So there's un it's still more or less unacceptable, but be apparently gaining ground, and there are some statistics to, to back this up. So if cohabitation is becoming more common, uh, one wonders if births outside marriage can be far behind. It hasn't happened yet, but perhaps it might. The trend is, as you can see, very marginally upwards, but from tiny levels. What about the Gulf states and the Arab world? Well, um, the first demographic transition isn't uh, quite finished yet, uh, so it, it may be rather premature to start talking about the second one uh, at this stage. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the birth rate in, in um, uh, the Arab states has, has gone down really quite radically uh, in the last uh, two or three decades, from quite high levels, from five or six or seven children on average per woman, uh, down to, in most cases, just over two. And this is typical of, of the rest of the world. About half the world's population now live in countries where uh, the, the birth rate is, uh, is insufficient to maintain the population in the long run. That is to say that they have uh, a birth rate of, of, of fewer than two children per woman. This does not mean, say, there is in population decline. That comes later. But, the, but, but um, family planning, uh, a decline in the birth rate is clearly uh, nearly universal and is, is, has happened quite fast uh, recently in, in, in the Gulf states. So that, that, is, that is underway, although population growth is still quite fast for reasons of demographic momentum. Certainly, there's progress in education uh, and in the economy. Uh, certainly, marriage is delayed, although not, I don't think, yet avoided by anybody. Uh, certainly, there's a high level of divorce. So, so the um, uh, second demographic transition checklist gets, gets those ticks. But um, other things um, are, are absent. Um, the, there's little evidence of cohabitation, as, as far as I know. Uh, births outside marriage are very few uh, and, and would involve very serious uh, family upsets, uh, as far as I can understand it, about this, these things I hope to learn very much more from this audience. Uh, there's very powerful, in most countries, sexual inequality. Women are, are often controlled. Um, female workforce participation of the uh, national population, the indigenous native population, is in most cases low. Um, and secularism, homosexuality, uh, adultery, and all the rest are very decidedly no-nos. Uh, in some cases illegal, uh, but certainly very powerfully frowned upon, not just by the authorities, but, but by, the, uh, but, but by the, the people in general. It is not acceptable a uh, form of behavior uh, for, for women anyway. Here is a fertility transition, late uh, but, but quite fast, starting off, as I mentioned, in the 1950s uh, up to uh, the 1970s, at about seven children per, per woman on average in all of the Gulf states, uh, falling down uh, rapidly to the present, uh, the present day as indicated by the vertical line. Uh, so we're, we're hovering around two, one or two, or already below two, uh, the United Arab Emirates and um, uh, Qatar are, are both below two already which is insufficient to replace the population in the long run. Of course, we have migration in huge numbers. Uh, others are uh, slightly higher, um, but declining. Um, on the right is a projection from the United Nations. And of course, I must emphasize that all projections are always wrong, but this is the best the United Nations can do with all their collective wisdom. Uh, and it seems, at least, as, at least one might say, plausible. Obstacles to the second demographic transition, you will know much better than I do, and I, I expect to, to learn much more from this audience the, 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 than I know. Um, but um, the, 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 um, the traditional nature of the society is, is pervasive, both in terms of its politics, in terms of institutions, its law, um, its sexual relations, um, uh, and, uh, and its adherence uh, to, to religion. Um, some challenges, perhaps, to it. Um, the Rapid economic growth and the growth of a consumer culture may perhaps lead to, to a, a, a new, new um, um, uh, forms of attitude. Um, is, is the population growth, which we have at the moment very rapidly uh, increasing, is this sustainable? Uh, in, in, it's faster in some countries than in others. Is that going to cause challenges which will provoke a, a rethink about the way society is organized? Most crucially, um, the development of female education. If you have a, a female population um, who, whose role is domestic, reproductive, and sexual, um, where it is not thought important or worthwhile to educate that half of the population, uh, then um, traditional patterns can persist, I guess, forever. If, however, for, for commendable reasons, um, and necessary reasons also, uh, it's thought desirable to educate 
uh, the other half of the population. So it becomes literate, so it, becomes, uh, uh, it moves up the educational ladder and starts competing uh, with, with men uh, for places in universities, which is very much the case in Europe. There are more men than women in, Euro in European universities uh, in many cases at the present time. Then everything has got to change because women who are educated especially they're moving into the workforce in a numbers, are not going to tolerate uh, uh, current circumstances. There's also a, future, uh, a, a, a threat to the future of the birth rate. And I have to say that, that, that there's a very interesting um, curiosity here. If you look at, at, at the developed countries of the world, there are no developed countries in the world where the birth rate is at what you might call an acceptable level. That is to say, uh, about 1.7 or more which is, protects you somewhat from, from decline and from uh, population aging. There is no population uh, where the birth rate is at an acceptable level where at least 30% of births are not outside marriage. Those countries in the developed world uh, where most births are confined to marriage have damagingly low birth rates. Uh, I'm talking about parts of southern Europe, I'm talking about the, the East Asia in particular, uh, these face population decline, uh, possibly unsustainable levels of population aging. Now, all I'm drawing attention to is a, uh, an empirical fact that you can't get a decent birth rate without lots of, of women having babies outside marriage, usually in coveting uh, associations, of course. If women aren't allowed to do it their way, uh, then the birth rate is catastrophically low. Now, th there may be exceptions to this. It may be the Gulf states will prove an exception and show the rest of the world that it can be done. Nobody else yet has done so. Um, so just to look at some of the data very, very briefly, uh, marriage is still universal, so, so no indication uh, f from uh, existing cohorts uh, that marriage is, is, is being uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, marriage is certainly being delayed. I haven't got proper data for the Gulf states, I'm very sorry. All I've got is, 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 is Western Asia, which is far too broad a, 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 a category, but it's, it's mostly Arab. And as you can see, percent of women currently married by age group um, are declining from 1970, which is the top graph, down to um, uh, the present time, 2010, which is the green graph, um, and projected by the UN again to 2030. Um, de delay of marriage, but no, as so far, not much reduction in proportions ever married. High levels of divorce, um, ratio of, of um, um, ma divorce to marriage, about uh, 30 divorces per 100 marriages per year. The same bad indicator that I used uh, for, the, for the Far East, but as I mentioned, it's the only one that I had to hand. And um, the future, to, to summarize. Um, the, the Gulf states do seem uh, ostensibly to be the least likely candidates in the world uh, for uh, acquiring uh, this Western uh, disease or pattern, whatever you want to call it, of the second demographic transition. Um, uh, there, is, there are, however, challenges. Uh, continued population growth combined with a continued decline in the birth rate, uh, the, the need for other reasons to, to indigenize the economy and diversify it, uh, which may, may make uh, the, mo mobilizing the female population into the workforce much more important than, than previously. If that happens, uh, then you are transferring power to women uh, away from men. Uh, the demands of a more educated population I've already mentioned, um, and the temporary migration system uh, has some question marks over it, not the least uh, being uh, as to whether it can remain temporary, uh, given uh, trends which I think uh, um, Dr. Philippe Fard will be talking about later on. So just to wrap up, um, this revolution in sexual behavior in, in, has, has happened in most Western societies. It's empirically there um, in living arrangements and the setting for reproduction and divorce and all the rest of it. Um, and it, it seems to be reasonably clearly associated with, with wealth, with welfare, um, with, with secularism, with the retreat of religion and, and other patterns of that kind, many of which are unthinkable uh, in, in, in the Gulf states. So far, it's only created diversity, not uniformity. I think this will this will remain the case. Um, the social and economic costs, I think, will limit its scope, uh, uh, both at the personal level and at the government level. Um, similar kinds of trends in marriage and divorce can be seen in, in uh, other parts of the world, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, for example, but they require different explanations. Um, the same phenomena may, may have very different causes in different parts of the developed world. Um, the circumstances in the Gulf are highly prof propitious, but the crucial factor is going to be female autonomy. If the progress of women um, uh, will challenge traditional authority, if I may be allowed to say so, um, and traditional patterns. And um, if women advance uh, in, in education, in the workforce, uh, in, in influence in the country, then it may well be 
uh, that, that which is now uh, unthinkable, uh, unimaginable, and for which there's little evidence, may finally come to pass, as it did in Britain from 1950 onwards. Chairman, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.